Okay, so the first thing I'm going to talk today is about the um, final project proposal. Um, it's due um, on March 2nd, so it's coming very soon. The reason why I have this deadline is because I would like to see what you propose to do and to be able to provide feedback as soon as I can. Um, but this is what I'm looking for, for your final project proposal. Um, so it should be a well-written three to four page description of what your proposed final project going to be. It's going to have the following sections. Um, of course, your team membership, introduction, what is the motivation and uh, what is a high level description of your project, objective, what is the objective goal of your project, what are you planning to do to achieve your uh, objective, data, what are the type of data your project will be dealing with, and how do you plan to get hold of such data sets, and what kind of insights are you planning to obtain from your data. Background, what are the state of art techniques in dealing with the data of your interest, right? So if you say, if you're looking at um, bringing some topology into a machine learning model, then what is the type of sort of uh, state of art um, in using uh, uh, the machine learning model? Uh, what are the state of art in the application of such machine learning models? Technical contribution, what are the expected technical contribution of your proposed work? What are the differences and similarities between your proposed work and then the state of art, okay? Um, expected outcome and deliverables, right? What are your expected outcome? What do you plan to hand in? For example, source code, video demo, so on and so forth, okay? What are the metrics to be used to evaluate how successful your project is? once it's completed by the end of the semester. So for example, if you are using sort of topological feature in addition to traditional feature to do say a, a regression or classification, then you want to show, for example, uh, how the classification accuracy got improved uh, using topological features. Uh, what does, you know, whether the uh, root mean square error get improved for regression tasks, um, you know, once you bring some topological flavor to your uh, to your pipeline. Uh, methods, right? Uh, what method are, are you proposed to develop? What is your strategies? Software, uh, what are the software or more well, possibly hardware do you plan to use? In the case, um, in the case you're working on software extension, what is the baseline software you plan to work with, right? For example, if you say, okay, I want to build my project on top of say Mapper Interactive or Kepler Mapper or Ripser, you know, those are the things you want to mention. Very importantly, item number 11, timeline. What are the various milestones you plan to achieve along the way? So what I'm looking for is by the time you submit your proposal um, until, you know, it's, um, it's uh, the final project is due on April 27, which is when the first presentation is happening. What are the various milestones you want to hit? And specifically, I'm looking for dates. For example, you know, say March 10th, I would like to be done with the serving of the state of art. By March, uh, you know, 17, I would like to start implementing this and this. You know, it, in some sense, the project has roughly, uh, you know, a two months of time span. Um, but you need to have a very careful planning of how you want to run your final project. Project summary, right? Finally, you're going to you know, ended it with a few sentences to answer each of those questions, right? So just a quick summary, overview, why is it worth pursuing? What is objective? What is the question you would like to ask? What data would you like to plan and use? How can we evaluate how successful your project is once it's completed? So it's going to be submitted in a PDF and I'm going to talk to Faye and she's going to set it up similarly where um, I think the main submission is going to be a PDF. And then if you have data, you're going to submit separately as a zip file with a data file. Okay, so in case we want to look at the type of data you're going to work with. Okay, any questions for final project proposal? No? All right. Okay, so um, again, this is due on March 2nd. 
So if you have not written down this thing, so I have a sense of some of your final project, but not all of your final project. So this would be a good opportunity uh, for me and Faye to look over and then to point out if there's any weaknesses uh, in your project proposal, whether the scope is too big or it's too narrow. And so we can provide feedbacks. Right, so the project proposal once you submit it, it's not necessarily have to be, uh, you know, a project set in the stone. So that our our hope is once you submit the proposal, that we can actually give you uh, quickly the feedback, so you can potentially modify your project direction, expand or shrink the scope of it. Okay, and one more thing I want to emphasize is make sure the project proposal you you are you know, you're submitting is aligned well with your expertise, right? For example, if you have zero machine learning experience in using any sort of deep learning model, then I would be a little bit worried if your final project is on modifying uh, existing uh, deep learning model, right? Because I would like to see the type of background that is aligned with your proposed work. Um, on the other hand, if you're more on the pure math side, then I would be perfectly happy to look at a proposal where it's a purely theoretical investigation. Um, that would be fine as well, okay? But what we are looking for is um, a project that is within scope and uh, that has just amount, the right amount of proposed work to be completed within the two months time frame. So if you have a project partner, you should get started uh, today <laughs> if you have not started to write this final project proposal. Okay, all right, that's one um, for today. Um, now for the rest of today, I have two agenda. Remember, we have been going through um, sort of uh, the, the algorithms for persistent homology kind of in a reverse order, which is intentional. I kind of first showed you what is a persistent homology algorithm. You know, if you actually run through the algorithms through a sort of column reduction of a boundary matrix. But now what I'm coming back, um, you know, to continue our last lecture is to give you a mathematical sort of formulation of the persistent homology algorithm. And then we're going to go back to also say that, okay, what is actually the algorithm to compute homology? It turns out the algorithm to compute homology is also a matrix reduction, uh, but actually the homology computation is slightly more complicated than persistent homology computation. That's why I'm having, I'm describing them in a reverse order. But but, you know, on the high level, it's again a reduction over a boundary matrix. So that's what we're going to focus primarily on this uh, this lecture. And then, if we time permits, I would like to talk a little bit over the concept of manifold. Uh, you know, it's kind of the concept of a manifold kind of lies in the back end. You know, because we a lot of times when we are dealing with topological data analysis, we assume the data point is sampled from a manifold. So at least I would like to talk about a manifold and it's especially two dimensional manifold. So you have a mathematical understanding whenever I say, what do I mean by a manifold? Okay. All right. So I'm going to share a different uh, lecture course here. Uh oh. Hmm. Can you see my screen? It's black right now. Okay. So might be a little bit issue. Hold on one second. Let me try again. I think I had a little bit issue earlier, but I was hoping this is fixed. Hmm. No. Let me try one more time. Uh oh, okay, sorry. My computer is now, it's not 
exactly at its best at the moment. All right, just a second. It's still a black screen. Uh oh, okay, just a second, let me see. Okay, I'm trying, I'm trying a slightly different one. was a trust window that keep disappearing. All right, the worst case scenario, you will not be able to see me right. You're going to just see my other uh, screen. Let's do that. So I don't have to further delay the lecture and I will figure out what's going on with my iPad later today. All right, so it's going to be slightly different than before, but uh, hopefully this doesn't. Okay, let me share this one instead. All right, can people see the slides? Okay, all right. So, yeah, so my iPad is not working today. So unfortunately, so we're gonna use this slides, but that's okay. So remember what we did last lecture where we talk about, um, you know, when we have a filtration, there's multiple ways to do a filtration. But what is a filtration, right? So we kind of end the last lecture by defining a filtration. And the starting point of a filtration is that, well, whenever I talk about filtration, in uh, I normally um, mean that it's a filtration of simplicial complexes, okay? So what I mean by that is to say that, okay, remember what is a simplicial complex? A simplicial complex is a collection of vertices, edges, triangles, tetrahedras, and so on and so forth. Um, and then there is sort of a function attached to uh, to the simplicial complex, such that the function is monotonic. And the monotonic means that if I have two simplices, uh, sigma and tau, where if sigma is a face of tau, for example, a, a edge is a face of a triangle, a triangle is a face of a tetrahedra, um, then the function value over those face has to be smaller or equal to um, from the function value of the simplest itself. What does this really mean is that if I order those simplices through this function value, like increasing function value, then the faces of a simplex always shows up earlier than uh, the simplex itself. okay? So what does this really imply? It means implies at any time of my filtration, that what I have at that time is always a simplicial complex. Because the definition of a simplicial complex is that one of the condition for the collection of simplices to be a simplicial complex is that, you know, whenever a simplex is in there, all its faces has already been there already. So this condition of monotonicity of the function is to enforce that whenever a simplex shows up, all its faces is already showing up. So it sort of satisfy the condition of the collection to be a, a simplicial complex, okay? The other, the other concept is what's called a sublevel set. So what the sublevel set do is a sublevel set is all the simplices in my simplicial complex that has a function value smaller or equal to a partic particular value, okay? That's sublevel set. Now, if I have an entire collection, let's say for the time being, I always deal with a finite simplicial complex, then there I can order the function value by increasing order. And I can go with the smallest value to the largest value. And in this particular case, um, oh, sorry, this has, to be, uh, this has to be minus infinity. There's a typo right here. Um, I will correct it on my slides later. This is a minus infinity. So I start with the smallest number. So if A0 is minus infinity, that means the F inverse 
of this is actually empty, right? You know, like, you know, so I, my starting point is I started with something empty and I gradually add one simplex at a time. And what I call filtration, I think there's a question over Piazza, what is a filtration? A filtration is a sequence of simplicial complexes. And in this case is a sequence of simplicial complexes such that they are connected by what's called, this is called an uh, inclusion map, right? I mean, in set notation, this means it's a subset. Um, you know, it's 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 an equal or subsets, but then in terms of maps, you can think about this, what's called an inclusion map. Because what happened is you start with a simplicial complex and you keep adding simplex one at a time. So your underlying simplicial complex actually just grows bigger. So it's a kind of inclusion relationship to a later one. So Pretty much you start with an empty set, you add one simplex at a time until you reach the entire simplicial complex, right? So it's, and of course, there is a lot of flexibility of how you get this simplicial complex. In the previous slides, you see that in this example, my simplicial complex is obtained by using the clique, what's called a clique complex of the graph. And then this is called a clique filtration. In the uh, sensor network, Remember in the sensor network, our simplicial complex is can be rips complex or check complex based on the radius parameter. So another type of filtration is to say, I am going to look at how the simplex is coming into the filtration when I'm increasing the radius parameter of my rips complex, okay? Again, as you increase the radius parameter of the rips complex, you get sort of increasing sequence of simplicial complex until you reach, they say, the final parameter. Let's say there is a particular radius parameter that is a maximum radius you want your sensors to be. And that would be the ribs complex at the last parameter, which is the entire simplicial complex. Now, once you have those simplicial complexes that is connected through inclusion maps, you can, for each of the fixed simplicial complex, you can compute the homology. Okay, so that's, so that's where, I mean, of course, we're using the p-dimensional homology where p is typically equal to zero, one, or two, and so on. So with a fixed dimension, you are looking at how the homology classes are now connected uh, into one another. So again, going back to this example, right, you know, if you look at this, this Betty number, Betty, uh, this Betty zero is looking at zero-dimensional homology and how zero dimensional homology sort of involve over time. For example, in this case, at, at this time frame that I have, you know, I have a total of nine zero dimensional homology, but the moment I move into the next time frame, I basically went from nine uh, connected components to one connected components. So you kind of keep track of, you know, how does a homology change over time? And that's really is a framework for persistent homology, right? You look at, you know, in some sense, naively what you look at is to say, well, if I can compute at each um, parameter i, right? The parameter i goes from a1, a1 to an, at each of those parameter, what is a corresponding homology group? And I'm going to study the mapping between them. But as you can see from the algorithm we studied to compute persistent homology, I don't have to independently compute the homology at each time frame, but instead I'm just going to compute the entire barcode or persistent diagram from just column reduction. Okay, but naively you can imagine what does persistent homology do is keeping track at, at a fixed time step, what is a homology and how does this homology map into, you know, uh, 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 as, as a homology group downstream. Okay, so what is example, right? You've seen this actually, this is one type of a filtration. Okay, so at K0, remember K0 is an empty set, you know, so there's nothing. And then I add a component, you know, which is represented by a vertex. I add another component. So K1 is sort of my first non empty simplicial complex in my filtration. And then the filtration kind of grows as I add more and more simplices into uh, the simplicial complex with the rule that the face of a simplex have to show up earlier. So in this case, I'm adding vertex one, uh, vertex two, forming K2, 
vertex three forming K3, vertex four forming K4, vertex five, okay? And now when I add the next thing, what I do is now I added all the vertices, now I'm going to add the edges, okay? So I can add, you know, the edge connecting one and two, the edge connecting two and three, the edge connecting one and three. And then the one connect one, four, one, five, and, you know, up until K11, which is all the, you know, simplicial complex, I have all, already just add all the edges. And now in K12, I am adding a triangle. Okay, so as the algorithm we have done before, we know that given this filtration, how do we construct my boundary matrix? My boundary matrix is going to have 12 columns and each of the column correspond to the simplex that shows up at that time. So the first column corresponding to vertex one, second column corresponding to vertex two, third column corresponding to vertex three, and then the 12th column corresponding to the triangle one, four, five, okay? So those are the columns of my boundary matrix and you're gonna use the same column as the rows and then you're just gonna do the matrix reduction as we did before. And that's how you compute the persistent barcode, okay? So we kind of already went through persistent homology algorithm. So, but you know, we're just coming back to say, okay, what do I mean by filtration? We kind of have been using it already. It's just a sequence of simplicial complexes, you know, satisfy a certain condition. Now, you know, this is sort of the mathematical formalism of this thing. So. What we're looking at in the lower part, this is also called a persistence module, okay? So I would say this may be one of the most technical slide for today's lecture. Um, and then there is a little bit of a concept what's called homomorphism, okay? So when we study group operations, we define a map between groups. And homomorphism is basically a map between groups that commute within the group operation. So what does that really mean is that if I, you know, essentially the sequence of homology groups are connected by those maps, okay? This maps happen to be homomorphisms and also they are linear maps, okay? So what does that really mean? That means this maps is well-defined to map a bunch of homology classes from the first group to the homology class to the second group, such that they satisfy a certain condition. What is that condition? It's a condition where if I have an operation that happened in this group, if I, if I kind of operate that operation over this map, that operation is still preserved. So in other way, this whole condition of homomorphism is basically saying that this map is sort of a well-defined map, okay? And in addition, this map is also what's called a commutative map, meaning that if I go from the ice group to the case group, it's the same as if I go from uh, sorry, uh, from I to J and from J to K. So this is really what the linearity comes in, meaning that, you know, if I go from, uh, you know, two groups, I would like to really annotate. So let's see if I annotate by hand right here. Great, I can actually do this. So this is not going to look as great as I would like to do. So if I have three groups mapped together, Okay, and let's say this is my function f from a, b, and this is function f, okay, from b, c, all right. Then I have also a function f from a, c, what this means is that my function from A, C can be described by a function from A, B to a function from B, C. So this on the right-hand side is a composition of this two function that gives function from A, C. So that's what it means, okay? All right, so let me again share my 
Uh, slides. All right. Oh, what did you see? Did you see the right slides? It's just black right now. Oh, man. Okay. I am getting kind of a weird scenario today. You see this? Yep. 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 Okay. All right. So now, right, remember I defined sort of homology before. So the part is that what is a piece persistent homology group? Well, it looks very mathematical. It says the piece homology group that are the images of the homomorphism induced by inclusion, the piece homology group going from I to J is the image of the function from the I's group to J's group. All right, this looks very complicated, but I promise you, once we look at a picture, this will become a little bit more clear. But what you're saying is that, okay, what I care about the homology are the ones from a particular image of those functions that connect between homology groups, okay? And then the Betty number is a rank of it. Okay, this will all look kind of complicated, but what is a picture? Here is a picture. So, Remember, I saw some form of diagram like this before, but that's just for studying homology. Now I am studying persistent homology. So what does that mean? Each of this black circle is the sort of the homology at a particular simpl simplicial complex during the filtration. So this whole circle here for the first circle is a homology the, the homology group at the i minus one step. The next circle is a hom the big circle is a homology at i step. And here is a homology at j minus one step. And the last one is a homology at the j step. So kind of think about each of the big circle as I go on is basically keeping track of a homology group at a particular step in my filtration. Okay, but what is a persistent homology? Persistent homology is saying that, well, at time i, where my simplicial complex is ki, I have an element gamma that is not in the image of the previous homology group. Okay, so remember this 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 uh, this line here. Hopefully, you can see it. Um, I want to annotate. Okay, so if I want to draw. So this line here, if you see this green line, this green line in the previous notation, I always mean it's an image, right? So this gamma right here is outside the image of this little black, uh, little gray circle. That means it's not in the image of the previous one, okay? So what does this mean in this picture? It means that this is a homology group that is born at this time, okay? So remember the barcode corresponding to birth and death. So if it's not in the image of the previous one and it's outside this image, this means that it's a birth event. So what is a birth event? Remember, if I have a bunch of point cloud and then you know I grow both surrounding them, let's say I'm using ribs complex, at some point at a particular parameter, you know, um, I would like to draw by hand, but now it's going to be a little bit tricky. Um, how does that work? Okay, so let's say you have, you know, a few point that is in my filtration. Let's say, you know, here, here, this is a previous filtration, let's say I'm too lazy, so I'm just going to do four points. So this is at k mi i minus one. I already have four vertices, and I have three edges. Okay, so this is my simplicial complex at k i minus one. At k i, this is where the last edge shows up. Okay, so you still this is k minus one, and then at k i, the new vert uh, edge that shows up is the last one I just drew. The moment I go from ki minus one to ki, there's a birth event. And that birth event, let's say my p is equal to one. So I'm looking at, you know, tunnels. So at this event, there is 
a tunnel that is bored, and this gamma is this tunnel. So this gamma here corresponding to the birth event of a particular tunnel, okay? And as you go along at some point, this tunnel is going to persist, okay? Let's say it's persist because for this whole rest of the filtration going from step I to step IJ minus one, it's that this tunnel persist in the way, oh, actually, let me be a little bit saying like, I want to make it slightly easier to understand. So let's say for the time being, I have a triangle here too, and then still there's a tunnel, okay? So throughout the whole process, maybe, even at step J minus one, I still have this tunnel, but maybe the rest of the filtration was growing elsewhere, okay? There's some other growth that is happening. But for this particular tunnel at this stage, this tunnel is still right here. But you could imagine in the next one, you know, at time J, what's happening is that this tunnel get filled in by the next step at exactly KJ time. So, you know, so what's happening here is you start with no tunnel and then the burst of tunnel and at time J, this tunnel disappear. When I say disappear, what did that mean? It actually became an image. So it's kind of forced into an image of this map and that's corresponding to the death event of this tunnel. Now, if you have a birth and death event, the persistence feature is going to, basically you're going to have a barcode that is starting at the parameter associated with AI and end at the parameter associated with AJ. So this corresponding to a barcode in my computation, but when I say it's actually dies, that means it actually became the image of the previous one, okay? So that's really the mathematical notation of what it is. But you know, for computational purpose, all you actually need to care about is this column reduction to get those barcode, right? Everything I'm describing is sort of the mathematical formulation of it. Okay. In this example, what happens to gamma in the J time step? Does it become a triangle? Or what happened? What happens to gamma in the J time step? Oh, the, so gamma, remember when I say gamma? Gamma is a linear combination. Yeah, this is a very good question. Remember at time I, gamma represent that particular tunnel, right? So gamma, let's say if I have this vertex one, two, and three. Gamma, in this case, I apologize for my technical difficulty, so I'm going to write it slightly slower. But what I have, gamma is a linear combination of edges to represent that loop. So it's one, two, plus two, three, plus one, three, right? This is something we went through before. It is a true tunnel because it's not it's not a boundary of a triangle, okay? What happened here, gamma, once I gamma gets here, gamma still is a linear combination of, of edges. Nothing changes. It's still the same gamma, except now it is a boundary of a triangle that's added. So what does that mean? That means the one dimensional circle, one cycle that is represented as this linear combination is no longer representing a tunnel, which corresponding to the death of that tunnel. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? So gamma remains as a one, as a linear combination of edges. That didn't change. But what has changed is going from time j minus one to time j, a triangle got filled in. And all of a sudden, gamma became the boundary of a triangle. So it's no longer part of my persistent homology group, right? That's corresponding to the death of it, right? I mean, when I say death, that means what it's corresponding to is no longer a legitimate tunnel because all of a sudden it became the boundary of a triangle. Okay? okay. So that's what it is. What's the, um, 
zero along the x-axis at the bottom? Oh, well, sorry. Zero is just means it's here. This point is zero. Is that like the null set? What's that? Is that the null set? Is it saying that? No, 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 zero is not. Zero is just an element in this in this group. So remember in the homology computation from previous slides, you know, something is in the kernel of a map, right? If this map, let's say this map is my map F, the kernel of map, the kernel of F is all the element which map to zero. So zero is just a root element in my group. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, okay, so let's go to Uh oh, <laughs> this is uh, this is something. Oh, <laughs> I forgot this annotation thing. Just a second, I need to kind of erase it. <laughs> it's different. Okay, so now we have to. So that's what the mathematical formulation of persistent homology is. And don't worry, this is not the only time you're going to see it. We're going to probably come back to this a few more times. So you are familiar with it. Um, but this is what homology does, okay? Um, now, right, so this is a slightly different example, but it's similar. So again, going from the first i minus one to i, what I have is because of the addition of this extra edge, addition of this yellow edge that create a tunnel which corresponding to this gamma as i go along this tunnel persists right which is right here this tunnel persists and when this triangle field in this tunnel got destroyed so that's why the, i have a burst time of at um, at ai and a death time at aj okay it's exactly the same example as i just drew and erased all right Okay, so now we know what persistent homology is. I kind of going backwards. I define what a homology is, but I never tell you how to compute it by hand. It turns out computing homology require a matrix reduction too, but it's slightly more complicated than actually persistent homology, which is a little bit surprising. So, so let's get back to homology. Oh, I have to remember erase this. Okay. So this is just a recollection of the concept we went through before, okay? K is my simplicial complex. P is my dimension. A P chain is a sum of P simplices, right? If P is equal to one, it's a sum of edges. P is equal to zero, it's a sum of vertices. And it's always using zero, one coefficient. A cycle is a chain with empty boundary, right? So, so if I take a, boundary of that one chain, it's zero, so that's a cycle. A boundary is a, uh, is, is a chain that is a boundary of, the, of, of a chain of a higher dimension. So a one boundary is a one chain that is a boundary of a two chain. So basically a linear combination of edges is a one boundary if they are the boundary of a linear combination of triangles, okay? So for example, in this particular case, uh, a one chain in here, is going to be one, two, plus two, four, plus three, four. That's a one chain because it's a linear combination of edges. A one cycle would be one, two, plus two, three, plus one, three. Okay. And a one boundary would be um, one, which is a boundary of a two chain. So one, two, plus two, three, plus one, three is also a one boundary because it's a boundary of a triangle, one, two, three. Okay. Um, by the way, I'm going to take a quick break, uh, five minutes, so that people can stretch legs and so on. Um, and hopefully during this time, I can fix what's happening with my, with my iPad. Okay, Faye, I'm going to try to exit and then come back again to see if that will fix it. Um, I think you are the host, right? I will make you a host.
All right, I'm just going to try to fix this later. It's still not working the way I would like it to be. Um, so, okay, so, so this is just a quick recollection of what is a one chain, what is a one cycle, what is a one boundary, okay? And a one boundary, remember, is a one chain that is a boundary of a two chain. So one, two plus two, three plus one, three is a one boundary, okay? But then two, three, uh, two, three plus two, four plus three, four is not because there's no triangle that is a boundary of, okay? And now the piece homology groups, as I said before, is a piece cycle group modular the piece boundary group. What, what that really mean? It means that it is cycle, but not a boundary. That's what this sort of modular means, okay? So if you look at what is the element in, in this space, what is in the one, uh, what is in the one's homology, right? H1 means one dimensional homology. Uh, what is in the element? As we mentioned before, some of the element are going to be two, three, plus two, four, plus three, four, because it's one, it's one cycle, right? It's a one cycle because the boundary is zero, but it's not a one boundary because it's not a boundary of a triangle. So the edge two, three plus two, four plus three, four is in the one dimensional homology group. All right. However, the other one, one, two, one, three plus two, three is not in the one dimensional homology group because yes, it's a one cycle because if I take the boundary, it's empty, but it's not a one bound, uh, but it's also a one boundary because it's a boundary of the triangle one, two, three. So it's definitely not a homology group. The other one, which is equivalent, it's representing the same tunnel is an edge one, two plus two, four plus three, four and plus one, three, okay? So this is a linear combination of edges it's a one cycle because you know it's kind of it's a loop right if i take the boundary it's zero but it's not a one boundary because it's not a boundary of a linear combination of triangles so the edge one two plus two four plus three four and plus one three are in fact in the one dimensional homology group okay so what is interesting about those two, okay? So I have to try to write it now. So I have, remember I have one of them. To be, to be one, two plus two, four plus, um, three, four plus one, three, okay? That's one of them. And the other one is two, four plus three, four plus two, three. Okay. And what I say is that both this, let's call this gamma one, and then this is gamma two. Or maybe if I don't do gamma, let's use C. Okay. What's interesting is, let's say this is C. This is a one dimensional chain. And then this is C prime. Okay. And I see both C and C prime is a part of the one dimensional homology group, okay? And what's the remaining of the slides is saying that the element that is in the one dimensional homology group is obtained by adding sort of one boundary to a given one cycle, okay? So what that mean is that C prime, okay? can be obtained by taking C and add some element that is a one boundary, okay? So let me use that gamma to be an element that is where gamma is an element 
Z is a one boundary. So can someone tell me what gamma equal to? One, two, two, three, three, one. Exactly. Right? So one, two plus two, three plus three, one, or one, three, doesn't matter, the ordering here. One, two plus two, three plus three, one is an element that is part of B1, which is one boundary because it's a boundary of a triangle. So if I take gamma, which is element in B1, added to uh, element C, I get C prime, okay? So what does this mean? This also is an indication that C and C prime are not independent from each other, meaning that I can kind of transform one to another by just adding one, um, one boundaries, okay? And, and what that implies is that in this case, even though both C and C prime is part of my homology group, they all correspond to exactly same homology class, meaning that there should only be one tunnel in this class, and which means that the rank, if I take the rank of this H1, is equal to one. Even though there's multiple different representations of it, there's only one tunnels in there. So the rank of this is one. Okay, so Betty number for this space is Betty one is equal to one. All right. Okay, so now I need to go to the next slides. Okay, so that doesn't change. So remember the piece Betty number is a rank of H1. And here is what the computation is for homology. What turns out the homology of it, the piece Betty number is a rank of the piece cycle group minus the piece boundary group. Okay, this again looks very algebraic, but let's do an example, okay? So, so in this case, what we have is how to compute homology. We kind of went, like I said, we're going sort of in a backwards order where we know how to compute a persistent homology already. Now I'm coming back to teach you how to compute a homology. So what is a rank of a uh, homology class. So again, I need to, oops, that's not what I want to do. Okay. I want to do the annotation. Uh -uh. Okay. All right. So wait. Oh, that's cleared on my screen. Perfect. All right. So the idea is I am going to work with a piece boundary matrix. So what is a piece boundary matrix? If I'm dealing with cycles, then I'm going to dealing with one dimensional boundary matrix. One dimensional boundary matrix is where the columns are going to be edges and then rows are going to be uh, vertices, okay? And we're going to do again a reduction, okay? And then the end result of the reduction is I would like to reduce the matrix into this form where on the upper left corner, there is a mat sub matrix, which just has one along the diagonal. And then the rest of the columns is actually empty. And then the rest of the rows is actually empty. Once you finish this reduction, then depends on how many, non uh, how many empty rows that corresponding to the rank of the piece cycle group and the rows, which is non-zero, corresponds to the rank of the P minus one boundary group, okay? So this is all some abstract, and then the best way to do this is do it by hand, okay? So let's do it by hand, and this is a very simple example. I want, remember, I want to compute now the homology of the space on the left. The space on the left has three vertices and three edges, and that's it, okay? So without doing any computation by everything we have learned so far. What is dimension one homology of this? How many, how many um, tunnels is this space? One. Yeah, that's exactly right. If this one, that means the Betty one is equal to, um, is it equal to one, okay? Because there is, okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through this boundary reduction again Okay, but slightly different boundary reduction. This is what's called Smith normal 
form. Okay, but to start, I have this thing here, which is my one dimensional boundary. One dimensional boundary is my columns are my edges and my rows are my vertices because the columns are corresponding to one simplicis. That's why this is called a one dimensional boundary. So it's the same thing. So I have three edges, one, two, two, three, three, one. So I have, you know, one edge, one, two is a boundary, one, two. Uh, vertex, vertex one, oh, sorry, vertex one, two is a boundary of edge one, two. You know, the boundary of edge two, three is vertex two and three and so on and so forth. So that's that. And now the reduction is slightly different in the sense that what I am doing now is I would like to reduce it to the form that, you know, at the end of the day, I have this upper level where on the upper level, I have sort of diagonal with ones and then the rest is all zeros. That is my goal, okay? And what I can do is, this is what's called after reduction is I'm going to do some sort of row and column operation to be in this, what's, so this form right here is called Smith normal form. It's a form where upper left corner is all sort of diagonal one, and the rest is empty rows and empty columns. That's what's called Smith's normal form. So what we need to do is we're going to do some column and row operation to get there. So what do I do, but how do I do that? What you see here is, let's say I'm going to do some row operation first to push, right? Remember in order to get to the first upper left corner, if in order to reach this one, this one has to be the unique one in its sort of across all these rows, okay? But before I have two of those ones. So in order to cancel out everything below it, I'm just going to add this row to the next row, right? Because then you can cancel it. So that's why this thing here, it says the row two is add a row one to it. By doing that, if you add the first row to the second row, you cancel out this first one right here, okay? Now, after this addition, when you, so I can actually operate it. So first row add to the second row, this cancel out, this is one, and this now become one. This is the first row added to the second row, okay? So we are here. Now what I want to do is again, I'm just going to focus on the row operation. I'm going to, I already have this one, which is the unique one along its column. Now I would like to make this one the unique one in this column. So I need to cancel out the one below it. So what I do is I add the second row to the third row, okay? When I add second row to the third row, you know, one plus one is zero, one plus one is zero. So everything canceled out. That's the state of it at this stage, all right? But now I kind of get the upper left corner into this form, but I still have outside this upper left corner, I still have a column that is now empty. So I need to empty out this column. That's where my column operation comes in, okay? So the next step is my column operation because I want to zero out this column. What do I do is um, what I can do is I add, I have to be careful. Did I do, ah, remember I made a mistake because I already add one, oh wait, hold on. Yes. So, okay, so what will happen is, first of all, I am adding, so there's a typo, that's why. I'm going to add the second column to the third column, okay? When I add the second column to the third column, I cancel out one of the one, but I still have the one remain, so I need to add the first column also to the third column, okay? So this is correct. So this one here is actually, this is, three one plus two three plus one two 
So if you add now the first column also to the third column, you zero out the entire column. So after both row and column operation, what I get is I get a matrix like this, okay? And then this is in Smith's normal form. Okay, so remember in the previous slides, I say, in the previous slides, once I get into a Smith's normal form, I can read the rank of groups based on how many empty rows and how many empty column it is. And that's exactly what we're gonna do. Once we reach this form, the rank of C0 is, so if you look at this, the rank of C0 is going to be the rank of Z0, which is the number of sort of columns, which is three, okay? So let's you know compare those two. So remember this right here, the number of empty column is the rank of Z1, okay? So num number of empty column, the rank of Z1, I have to annotate, sorry, this is a little bit slow than I expected. The rank of Z1 is the number of empty columns. The rank of B1, okay? So the rank of B1, if you look at the previous slides, in order to get the rank of B1, I actually need to go through one dimension, a different dimension, because the current rank of B1 has to come from um, the, the matrix, the boundary matrix of one dimension higher. But the interesting thing about this space is that I don't have a triangle, okay? So, so if I want to look at the rank of B1, I basically need to look at the boundary matrix sigma two, right? But that matrix is empty, okay? So which means the rank of B1 is equal to zero. So now I know the rank of Z1 and the rank of B1, then I know the rank, which is Betty number, right? So the rank of the dimension one homology is those two minus each other. So that means it's one minus zero is one. So what does this mean? This means after computation by those rank, I get that this space has one tunnel and that's it. Okay. And then the other thing I need to do is to compute what is, um, what is how many component there is, right? This space is very simple. It has only one component. So in order to compute the Betty zero, I need to rank of Z zero minus rank of B zero, okay? So how do I get to rank of B zero? Remember rank of B zero is number of non-empty rows, okay? If you go back to the previous slides, the rank of B zero, when P is equal to one, rank of P zero is number of non-zero rows. So in this case, rank of B zero is equal to two, okay? So we get that. This is two. And then how do we get the rank of Z zero? Okay, so again, what is rank of Z zero? In order to get one of rank of Z zero, I need to go back to uh, the zero dimensional, right? Rank of Z zero is zero dimensional boundary matrix. Whoops. Zero dimensional boundary matrix actually, you know, without without going through the through the uh, matrix form, you know, what is Z0? Z0 is number of zero chains, okay? There's three vertices. So if I were thinking about zero chains, there's three of them. So this is rank three. So that's three minus one, two is equal to one. Another way to think about it is the rank of Z0 has to come in from the zero boundary. So what is a zero boundary? Zero boundary matrix, if I were going to write it, the zero boundary matrix is just going to have three columns where each column is denoted by the three vertices. 
Okay, and it's empty because you know the boundary of a vertex is empty. So the rank of the rank of z zero is just number of columns, and then there's three vertices, so there's three columns. So that's why it's three. Okay, so. This example, I want to spend time to go over this example is because it turns out in order for me to compute the rank of homology groups, I need to go through column and row reduction to arrive at Smith's normal form. And as I described for both Betty 0, Betty 1, I need to look at two matrices. Okay, so that's why the computation is a little bit more complicated is because in order for me to recover the rank of the homology groups, I need to compute two boundary reductions. Again, you know, why? Because if I, in order to get Betty one, uh, sorry, just a second. I need the rank of Z1 and the rank of B1. And those two ranks coming from two separate matrices. So you basically need to do two matrix reduction in order to get the homology. Okay. Okay, so, right? So, so here, this is a take home exercise and hopefully by the next, next lecture, I will fix my, um, <laughs> fix my iPad so we can actually do it by hand in a more faster way. But I would like you to try this process as what I just did to compute the Betty numbers. So for each of the Betty number, um, you need to do two matrix reduction. Okay. So in this case, this is a simplicial complex that has four vertices, six edges, and, uh, and three triangles. Okay. So um, no, actually it should be have four triangles. Never mind. It has should have this is a typo here. It should have four triangles because if it only have three triangles, I wouldn't have a void. So this is a typo here. It has four triangles. Okay. So I would like you to do the same process as we did. Is in this case you need to do row and column reduction to reduce each of those boundary matrix to a Smith normal form, and then you can read from the reduced matrices the rank of homology groups. Okay. Okay, any questions? What does the row of the zero boundary matrix represent? So the zero boundary matrix is really just the columns are just vertices, right? And then the row is just empty. So it, it, it's represented that if you take the boundary, remember if you take the boundary of a vertex, it's zero. That's what it means. It's a it's an empty boundary in a way. I see. That's what it is. But really, in most practical scenarios, if you just want to know the rank of z zero, it's just number of vertices um, in in the in in the in the in the in the filtration. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So thank you. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to move on to lecture eleven, and uh, let's see how far we go. The good news is that 11, I think I don't have too much I uh, have to write because it's mostly description. So let's see. can people see lecture 11? Yep. Okay. All right, so I want to describe a little bit over manifold. I kind of use a term without really defining it. Um, locally, okay, so a mat two manifold, especially two manifold without boundary is a topological space whose points all lies in open disks. What this mean is that this means that locally, it looks like a plane. Okay, so what is a classic example of a two dimensional manifold without boundary? It's a surface of a donut, which is what we call a torus. If I look at every, if imagine yourself to be an ant, right? You can only look at a little tiny neighborhood in your, you know, on the manifold. If this is where the ant is, you look at your neighborhood, it looks like you know, an open disk or locally, it looks like a plane, right? And that's why, you know, and on the right hand side, this is a sphere. And then if you are a person standing on this, let's say this is a surface of the earth. If you look at locally, locally in the area where you can see, you believe you are on a plane uh, and earth is flat is because locally you look like a two dimensional, right? A plane is a two dimensional, uh, you know, R2, right? So it looks like a plane. So that's why it's a two manifold because locally it looks like R2. 
Um, and now if I want to create a two manifold with boundary, you can actually take out a small tiny disk from here or small tiny disk from here. So if I take a small tiny disk, open disk from it, it's open, right? So the boundary is dotted. You end up with a manifold uh, with boundary. Okay, so what is a boundary? The boundary is exactly the boundary of the disk you took out. So what is an example of a two-dimensional manifold with boundary? A rice bowl is a two-dimensional manifold with boundary. Okay, so the boundary is a rim of the bowl. Okay, so what is a three manifold? Now you ask, right? A three manifold is where if you look, if you're standing in a three manifold locally, you look like your neighborhood is R3. So locally, it looks like a, a cube essentially, right? Like you have three dimensions you can look. And what is a one manifold? A one manifold, if you have a straight line, in a one manifold, you look like it's a line, right? It's R1, okay? So if you have not, I think, I think there's an interesting book. I think it's called Flat, Flat, Flat World, I think. It's, it's, it's called- Oh, flatland. Yes, flatland. Okay, my mind's a little bit flatland. If you flatland is entirely the play of those topological concept, right? So uh, there's also some geometry, and it's a very interesting read. You know, once you understand what do you mean by two manifold, three manifold, and one manifold, and so on. Okay, it's a very interesting read. So if you uh, you know want to uh, take some time off, especially for uh, the week of March eighth uh, is where uh, you know we don't have class on Tuesday, so can take that time to do some reading uh, of you know fun novels. Okay, so the next thing is that what's interesting about the whole manifold idea, especially two manifold idea, is that you can actually create manifold by doing some sort of gluing operation. Okay, so first of all, what is, what do I mean by that? The top row are all the classic two manifold without boundary, a sphere, right? A torus and a double torus, okay? The bottom are examples of manifold with boundary. For example, a disc, okay? Which is also a rice bowl, a cylinder and a Mobis strip, okay? However, there is the concept of orientability, like whether a manifold is orientable or not. One type of definition, uh, well, one easy way of definition is, let's say what is an orientable manifold, like a sphere is an orientable manifold. What do I mean by that? If I triangulate, so meaning that I'm going to approximate the surface of the sphere by a bunch of small triangles, I can find a orientation, I can define an orientation of each of the triangle in a consistent way throughout the whole sphere. When I say, you know, what is uh, orientation? I mean that, okay, so if this is a triangle, this is one way to orient it. And this is another way to orient it, right? So those are opposite way to, or it's a, supposed to be an arrow, okay? Those are opposite way to orient my triangle, okay? So if you can orient all the triangles that is triangulating my manifold in a consistent way, that means this is an orientable manifold. Otherwise, it's not. So what's interesting about Mobis strip, okay, is that it's actually a non-orientable manifold. So what's happening is that if you actually triangulate Mobis strip by a bunch of triangles and you start kind of orienting them, you cannot orient them in a consistent way, okay? Another really interesting thing, so how do you create a Mobi strip? You just take a really long rectangle, okay? And when you, when you glue straight back, you create a cylinder in the middle. But if you create one single twist and you glue back, that's your Mobi strip. And then the most interesting part of Mobi strip, if you put a little end over Mobi strip, and as end to go around, it's going to traverse all the front and back face of it. In fact, there's no clear separation between what's in the front and what's in the back. And that contrary to an orientable manifold, for example, where 
I can define what is interior of the, what is its interior surface, what is its exterior surface. But for the Mobius strip, you cannot define that. That is also another way to study, define orientable, orientable or not orientable, okay? And another interesting part of a Mobius strip is that its boundary is a single cycle. If you traverse that boundary, it's actually a one single cycle, okay? So have you ever done this when you are young? If you take a Mobius strip and you cut along the center line, What is a, what do you get? Two Mobius strips? You, no, you get one really long strip. Yeah, you actually get one very long one. However, if you do one more cart down the center line, you will get two nested rings. So if you take a Mobius strip, you cut in the middle line once, you get a bigger loop. And then if you cut it one more time through the center, you get two nested ones. That's what Mobis strip does. Okay. It's very interesting. So again, if you want to play with scissors um, later today. All right, so that is about orientability. The next property for manifold, two manifold. Okay, so again, if, if all closed curves in a two manifold are oriental uh, preserving, then it's orientable. That is a mathematical definition. And you can create a compact two manifold using what's called polygons of polygonal schema. And we're going to describe that soon. Well, along the way, I need to give you a concept of what's called compact, okay? A manifold is compact if for any open cover of this manifold by open sets, for example, I can cover the surface of a sphere by open disks, okay? That's called an open cover. We can find a minimal finite number of sets that cover it. Okay, so this is a little bit, you know, mathematical, but all that means is that I can, for every time I cover the manifold with open disks, for example, I can find a finite subset that covers the entire space. Okay, and a space, a subset of Euclidean space is compact if it is closed and bounded. Okay, so what do I mean by bounded? The bounded it means it can be contained in a ball of a finite radius, okay? So the ones I gave here, a lot of the sort of um, nice space that we talk about here, for example, the sphere, the torus, those are all compact manifold. The, the most important part I want to mention, uh, of course, excuse my, my annotations, is that for compact manifold, there's two infinite family of them, okay? The first family is all the orientable, orientable ones. The second family is all the non-orientable ones. And the first family is constructed by sphere and torus and sum of sphere and torus. And I'll define what that sum mean. The second family is projected planes and the sum of projected planes, okay? so. Those are all the possible two manifold without boundary. So what do I mean by that? Okay. So this is really what's called the classification theorem for two manifold. Essentially two manifold can be constructed by gluing things together. And then the gluing things that we're going to do, the object are sphere, the torus and, um, and projected plane, okay? And I'm going to do one more slide and then we're going to move on to the uh, you know, next lecture. So what is a torus? So this is what's called polygonal schema. If I take a square to create a torus, you glue the top edge to the bottom edge. So you see that the arrows going from left to right, you glue the top edge to the bottom edge. You, you now create a tube and you glue the left sort of end of the tube to the right end of the tube. That's your torus. A sphere is you glue the top edge to the left edge, the right edge to the bottom edge. So it's like folding a dumpling. Okay. And then you will have to identify. Yeah. So that's like folding a dumpling. That's how you create a sphere. Um, 
to create what's called a projected plane. It's a little bit tricky, and you can't really do that. <laughs> Uh, to that, you know, in 3D in a nice way. But what happened, um, you glue the top to the bottom, except you create one twist. And you have to twist it, okay? You glue left to the right, you create another twist. To create a Klein bottle, okay, you glue the top to the bottom without twist. So now you have a tube. And then glue left to right with a twist, okay? So essentially, you can actually describe a lot of the two manifold by this polygonal schema. And then hopefully what we can do at the beginning of next lecture is we can take a piece of paper and try to do that. But what's interesting about this is actually this kind of gluing operation kind of describe the fundamental object that we work with uh, when we are creating more complicated two-dimensional manifold. And when I say gluing, I literally mean, you know, a double torus is taking two individual torus, cut off by an open disk and glue them together. Okay, that's how I create all the orientable to manifold. Okay, so I can keep going on forever, but let's stop the lecture now. And, um, and then, you know, I'm open for questions. And